Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fadi, and I will be presenting today's webinar on sheet metal formability testing with digital image correlation, with focus on the automotive sector uh, and the evolving materials in the automotive sector. I would like to thank you very much for joining our, our webinar today. And before we start, we would like to provide a very quick overview about AMT. Uh, AMT is a material testing lab that's focused on advanced testing of materials and components by combining state-of-the-art facilities with um, digital image correlation and optical metrology. And we do that um, through a team of highly skilled personnel that are really interested in material deformation. So when we do testing, we don't do it just for the sake of producing results, but rather to understand material deformation and behavior. And we try to elevate the outcomes of conventional testing by going beyond standard tests to customize testing solutions so that we can address difficult uh, material testing problems. The types of tests we perform range from the very simple tension tests to more complex spring back tests and formability testing that we're going to talk about today and even beyond to even more complicated tests. We typically like to share a video of the type of tests that we perform, especially the challenging ones. And today I picked a high strain rate test that was performed at the upper limit of strain rates that are needed by the automotive sector, which is roughly speaking 500 strains per second for a, a DP600, a typical steel. And as you can see, this is the type of results that we show, a video that shows material deformation all the way to failure with good correlation. This is a DIC video, obviously, that shows good correlation all the way to the end of the test, despite the fact that this is a very challenging test uh, given the strain rate that is the case here. We work with uh, multiple clients, uh, mainly from the automotive sector. We work with many OEMs and uh, suppliers of aluminum and steel and tier one suppliers um, on different topics. But today's webinar is again about metal formability, a very big topic, very important topic to the automotive sector. And our objective today is to provide a practical guide to automotive formability testing. So whether you are new to the topic, or familiar with the topic, but you are trying to bring formability testing in-house, we hope that we will provide you a very good background about how to do that. Uh, what are the things that you should pay attention to, whether it's infrastructure or the testing or the analysis, especially with DIC. And if you're experienced in formability testing and you've been performing it, we would like to share with you some of our guidelines or the experience that we've had with the vast number of materials that we've tested over the past few years, especially aluminum and steels in this case. Um, obviously, from the title of the webinar, we've decided to push some other topics to a future webinar, and we will discuss that briefly at the end of the webinar, and we will tell you about those particular topics. But let's start today with formability and a very brief introduction about it. To start with formability, we have to go back a step, and that's to go and define ductility. Ductility is a material property, and it's a measure of the material's ability to stretch prior to failure. And that definition of failure depends on the perspective. But let's take a tension test, a standard tension test. If we perform such a test uh, on a dog bone sample, we typically generate a stress strain curve as the one that's shown here. And here, failure could be defined as either the point of rupture, which is the end of the stress strain curve when the sample breaks, or simply depending on the application, the end of the uniform deformation uh, zone. And regardless what, the ductility of the material can be driven by one of the two. So we could be talking about the uniform ductility, or we could be talking about the tensile ductility or the total ductility, depending on which point is of most interest to our application. But either way, that tensile ductility is a material property, and it's typically associated with directional uh, material deformation. When we move to automotive stamping, and the type of processes that sheet metal or sheet metals are experiencing uh, during these processes, it's often the case that the material undergoes by axial material deformation rather than uniaxial tension or uniaxial uh, deformation. Therefore, this tensile ductility becomes irrelevant or maybe not truly representative of material deformation. And that's where we start using the term formability or migrate to the term formability which could be described as uh, simply the ductility of the material quantified in a biaxial domain. One other factor that goes into the definition of formability or the concept of formability is also the interaction that happens between the material and tooling. 
So it's often the case that people say formability is not really purely a material property, but rather involves other factors like uh, surface, uh, basically friction with the tool or the die, pressure that comes from the stamping process and so on. But regardless what, if we focus on the simple definition of having formability describing the ductility of the material in a biaxial domain, how do we quantify it? An FLD is the tool that we use to quantify formability for sheet metals. And FLD or an FLC is simply a map that describes that ductility in the biaxial domain. So if we take a segment of the material that's undergoing biaxial deformation in the sheet metal stamping process, that map is technically describing the relationship between major strains and minor strains, or simply speaking, X and Y strains that this material is undergoing during the process. This map has basically three main points, anchor points, that define fundamental or important loading paths or strain ratios or biaxial conditions. That's the uniaxial tension and the plane strain tension and the biaxial tension as shown in my schematic here. And so that's the full domain of biaxial deformation that we see um, in typical forming operations, especially automotive st uh, stamping or stretching. Now, if we were to take a material and force the material to deform under different ratios or biaxial different, uh, different biaxial ratios all the way to a point of failure. And if we were to take those combinations of major and minor strains that define that uh, criterion of failure, we would obtain a cloud of points as the one shown here. And if we connect these points, we would obtain a curve, a V-shaped curve that looks like, roughly speaking, the one I'm showing here on the screen, and that is our FLC. And FLC basically describes uh, a margin between the safe forming zone and the zone of failure or potentially uh, having failure in the stamping process. It's not unusual to have more than one FLC on an FLD domain. Um, and they could be both experimental. For example, you know, I'm showing here FLC one being based on a certain algorithm or method of identifying FLC points experimentally, and FLC2 is another approach that is more conservative, which is a little bit higher. It's also common to see other arbitrarily, arbitrarily drawn FLCs, such as FLC3, which is just basically um, drawn for safety margin of 10% or 20%, and that's very common in the circle grid analysis that is in the automotive sector. But regardless what, uh, whether one or two or more that is the FLC that we are after and we would like to uh, quantify. But just before we move forward, what does an FLC represent in terms of failure? What is that criterion for failure? Is it really um, fracture or is it before fracture and how do we define it? If we were to borrow that schematic or diagram from tension testing, uh, if we were to compare an FLC to the tension curve or to the uh, tens tensile deformation, any point on that FLC would technically fall somewhere in between the point of uniform deformation and fracture. So it's it's somewhere in between. And whether it's closer to the uniform ductility point or the total ductility point really depends on the method or the algorithm that we use to extract that point, as we will describe later. But it's technically somewhere in between. The more conservative ones are the ones that are heading towards the uniform ductility, and the less conservative ones are the ones that push it more close to the total fracture uh, point. So now let's talk about how to construct such FLCs. And we will start with the infrastructure and tooling. To make it a bit clearer, we have here a schematic of what a typical formability testing looks like. And here we have a test sample that we would like to deform all the way to a failure point that is clamped or held firmly between two binders. And we have a punch of a certain shape that is driven against this sample to deform it to the point of failure. So we can see here, we have requirement or a requirement for having two means of independent control of two types of forces, the clamping force to hold the sample and prevent it from sliding, and another one, which is the punch force that is responsible for deforming the material. Once we do that and we start deforming the material, we must monitor a couple of uh, items that are ne necessary for FLC. Typical, just like the tension testing, we must record forces, so we need a force sensor, and we must record deformation or strains, and that's a deformation sensor. But unlike tensor tension testing, um, force in FLC testing is not essential, and technically, we could compute FLCs without having any idea what the force level is during the test. So what matters here the most is the deformation sensor, which is digital image correlation, which we will talk about um, soon. Let's go to the equipment. As 
straightforward as it sounds, this is one of the biggest questions that we get from our partners, colleagues, uh, customers, and so on when they want to move to formability testing, which is the type of equipment that they should go with. And of course, there are two options, two major options out there. Either we go with universal formability testers, like the one shown on the left-hand side here, which are basically self-contained pieces of equipment. They're hydraulically driven. They have the power unit inside, and they have the hydraulic cylinders that drive the punch and the binder or the clamp. And you have the tower of tooling that accepts different types of toolings for different types of formability testers or tests um, as needed. They're very compact and they're, like I said, self-contained. The other type of equipment is simply a dual acting hydraulic press because that's technically what it is. You just need two independent mechanisms to control forces. And so any hydraulic press would do. A comparison between the two is really, um, it's not really possible without having, um, um, based on just five points. In terms of footprint and um, and the space that this equipment requires, of course, obviously the universal formability testers are definitely more compact and you know, more suitable for this kind of testing if you can get the right capacity uh, of the machine. But that's where we have a drawback. These machines, uh, once you get to a 1000 kilonewton, uh, in terms of punch force or clamping force, these machines become very large, and I don't know of any machine that can go beyond that. So if you want higher capacity, your better option is to go with hydraulic presses, which are usually labeled as more flexible, and that's not necessarily true because um, the formability testers can do exactly the same thing. You can interchange tools as you like, but I think they usually get a slight plus from the idea that you can put there some uh, tryout dice if needed. But to be honest, um, very few people I know do both of them on a large scale. It's usually, usually you either do formability testing or you do um, uh, stamping operations or tryouts and so on. But regardless what, whether it's footprint or practicality, the ergonomics and so on, or whether it's the capacity and the flexibility, the two systems are comparable, uh, but it depends on the application. Um, in terms of cost, both of them are technically bad. They're very expensive, and that's one of the reasons why these pieces of equipment are not very popular um, out there. So to give you an idea about what we decided to do, because we do a lot of materials, we, we do formability testing for a wide range of materials, from very soft aluminiums to very high-strength steels, we decided not to go with either option because with, there were some drawbacks either way we go. So what we've decided to do is to simply customize a hybrid system that combines the benefits of the two. And this press that uh, we see here um, has basically twice the capacity of any formability tester, a standard formability tester, but it still has basically a very small footprint and very practical, and it allows us to do anything in terms of formability testing, including testing, um, let's say, two or three millimeter advanced high strength steels. Nevertheless, you know, we still have some drawbacks and we are now working on a new optimized hybrid system that fully integrates um, the formability part of the testing with optical sensors and the IC and so on. And so ultimately, um, for people who are looking to invest, it's a matter of what are the uh, requirements? Are you testing again aluminiums or steels? And are you doing it for R&D or for qualification? And we are more than happy to help or answer questions about this. Now that we talked about digital image correlation, um, it's obviously the system that is on top of the press and you've seen it in my schematic um, or schematics. And it's simply there to provide the data that we need, which is to characterize the deformation of the material during testing. Unlike tension testing, DIC here is not an option. It's actually a must. For FLC testing, there is no other way to measure strains um, to generate FLCs, simply because the strains that we need here are not really linear strains. So you can't really put an extensometer, whether it's laser or video or whatever, it doesn't matter. You need surface strains, you need 3D surface strains, and that can be done by FLC. And the important thing to know here or to focus on is that these strains by themselves do not mean much. It's the following step, taking these strains and running certain algorithms or scripts to obtain the FLC points is what's important. So which DIC system to consider? Just like the equipment, we get so many questions about should we consider DIC system A or B? And this is again, not a straightforward answer. 
And we will start with, should we start with 2D versus 3D DIC? Obviously, the answer here is, of course, you need to start with 3D DIC simply because we have out of plane deformation that is um, uh, typically there with FLC testing. Nevertheless, we're going to leave this topic for another presentation or another webinar. We have talked about the value and the power of 2D DIC for those who are unable to start with 3D DIC systems simply because they're very expensive. And we will show in a future webinar, just like we've done before, we've done it for tension testing, shear testing, plane strain testing. We've shown that 2D DIC is more than capable of matching the results of 3D DIC. And we will show it again for FLC testing, certain conditions you can produce very good FLCs with 2D DIC. But for now, let's assume that we are going with a 3D DIC. So which system, which commercial system should we go with? All systems out there can generate the surface strains that we need that you see on the left-hand side. There's no problem there. I mean, you can correlate the strains, and typically those strains are not very large. For the softest mild steel, we're talking about 100% uh, strains, and so a typical DIC can do that. The issue is not there. It's the post-processing scripts, taking those surface strains and using them to extract the FLC points. That usually requires certain scripts, algorithms, um, and um, that is really more essential than the computation or the correlation itself. Personally speaking, I would stay away from any system that doesn't offer this, especially for starters in this field. I wouldn't start, I wouldn't go with any system that doesn't offer me a starter package of scripts because it is a significant effort to go and develop those on your own. And just a disclaimer, even those systems, the commercial systems that have these scripts integrated within the software may not always work. In fact, I would say they don't work sometimes, and you should be prepared to edit and adjust and develop um, some other scripts. And so that's why I emphasized earlier that it's better to have at least a package that, that have a starting point for you rather than starting from scratch. And one last thing, which is very important, we, we hear this every now and then, that there's always a push you know, for this new system has better cameras, whatever. We used to work with four and five megapixel cameras in the past. Now we hear about 12 and 16 megapixel cameras, and we just want to emphasize this very simple point. Higher resolution cameras do not necessarily mean that you're going to get better results. In fact, sometimes it's a drag, and it doesn't really help you um, in terms of um, the resolution of the measurement or the accuracy of the FLC that you're going to generate. So you just need to be careful um, in regards to that. So now we move from equipment to tooling. Now the direct interaction between the uh, tool that you're using for FLC testing and the material that you're trying to deform. And the tooling that I'm showing here is the custom tooling that we have um, to meet our system. And it doesn't, you know, most of the details there don't matter. What matters is the binders or the clamping rings, whatever you want to call them. These are the rings that hold the material sample in place during testing. And it's all about those binders. It's all about their design, and in particular, the beads on those binders. And it's not actually very straightforward or not that simple. You see these binders with a single large bead. That's common. But we also use or design and build a lot of those other binders that um, use multiple rings or multiple smaller beads, serrated beads sometimes, and sometimes they're smaller beads. And there are many details that go with that. The geometry of the bead, um, the geometry of those serrations is very important. And that depends on the material that you're trying to test. And we will show um, as we go today several samples or several um, materials that were deformed successfully. And you will notice that um, in some cases we used a single bead and in some cases we used serrated beads. And we've worked with so many, so many customers on this issue of trying to find the right type of tooling that matches uh, the requirements by a certain material. If you are working with multiple materials, uh, especially like R&D centers, um, that deal with, let's say, steels and aluminiums, you will see the effects of this tooling more prominently when dealing with aluminium alloys versus advanced high strength steels, and especially when you move from Nakajima to Marshniak testing, as we will describe um, shortly. So now let's go to the test types by tooling. Uh, obviously, we have Nakajima and Marshniak, or what we call them out of plane versus in plane testing. These are very popular, very common. 
but I just put the schematics there to um, simply show the difference between the two, and that is the shape of the punch. We have a hemispherical punch with Nakajima, and we have a cylindrical punch with Marchignac. The standard size for both of them is about 100 millimeters. And some of the differences between them are very uh, clear. So let's start with the first four lines there. Uh, obviously, Nakajima involves bending out of plane deformation, and also it involves friction. And that's not the case with Marchignac. It's pure stretching. There's no out of plane deformation. And with carrier blanks, there is technically no friction at the center of the sample. And because of that, Marchignac is credited for having better or more linear strain paths than Nakajima. And therefore, it should be the better test. The results are not really skewed. There's no bending effect and so on. And there's no frictional effect. And that is up to here all true. But practically speaking, um, Nakajima testing in terms of tooling is simpler and the test itself is easier to perform. There's no carrier blank. There's, and, and that really invites a lot of trouble in terms of alignment and so on. Nakajima testing works almost always. There are some exceptions, of course, with soft metals under biaxial, uh, biaxial testing. But Marchignac is typically more problematic. It doesn't work for many materials. And we will talk about this a little bit more. And most importantly to us, material failure is very important in FLC testing. And it's usually more favorable with Nakajima. It, it tends to fail uh, in a better way. And it's not only about the failure at the center of the sample. It's, it's multiple other things, as we will show in, in one of those videos. While Marchignac is a little bit more problematic when it comes to even failure. And finally, from equipment and investment, um, if you're thinking about doing Nakajima, the force levels are, let's say, X. If you take the same material and test it in, you know, under Marchignac tooling, um, you're almost now going to 50% to 100% extra capacity needed in order to perform those tests. So from all those things considered, Nakajima testing is used more often and Marchignac is used far less. Um, and that's at least what we see from the industry and our customers. The demand for Nakajima is usually much higher. There are some other formability tests, and we don't want to talk about them too much, but I just want to mention here Erickson testing, Fukui testing, and so on. These tests usually run under the same principles, but the tooling is slightly different. Uh, typically, Erickson test, for example, that's the popular one, uses a 20 millimeter punch, which is you know, basically a small punch, involves more bending and more friction, but it's not really used for FLC determination. It's more of a semi-qualitative test that is usually driven by the height of the notch or the, the, the dome that's generated by the punch. Another test is the hydraulic test, uh, sorry, the bulge test, whether it's hydraulic or pneumatic. And we will discuss this in the second webinar because it shouldn't be really relevant here. That's not a standard test for FLC, but we will show how you might need this test, especially the hydraulic test for um, obtaining FLCs for certain materials that are really difficult to deal with, uh, where Nakajima and Marchignac fail to address the need of that material. But we will wait or we will uh, talk about this in the next webinar. Let's talk about FLC testing itself. And let's just go through the basic or the important steps and important notes that we should keep in mind when we do FLC testing. So the first step is the selection of sample geometry or sample geometries. Um, these are basically samples of different um, designs or uh, as you can see at the bottom there they share a certain shape but they have different widths and the idea is very simple your FLC testing whether it's Marchignac or Nakajima are both axisymmetric so the only way or the only tool you have in your hand to change the biaxial strain ratio to fill an FLC or an FLD is simply to play with the sample geometry and that's the main drive and then after that, you have a little bit more control by changing your holding force and the frictional conditions between the sample and the tool. And that's it. And so that's why sample geometry is very critical for you to be able to fill your FLD domain. The shape, the overall sh shape is described in the ISO 12004. That's the main standard that describes formability testing. But it doesn't give you the exact dimensions. It just gives you recommendations. And you must go through an iterative process of development to uh, arrive at some sort of optimized geometries that you can use for testing. That optimization or those geometries um, are never the same from one material to another. Um, and there is always a need for adjustment and modification, especially when you jump from, for example, advanced high steels to go to typical steels or mild steels. 
or to go to aluminum alloys. That requires some adjustments. Also, when you go from a certain loading path to another, um, or, or, or if you consider one particular loading path here, the plane strain, um, you might have to adjust because the response of different materials to that particular loading case are technically different, especially when you go from Nakajima testing to Marchignac. That requires a lot of adjustments and a lot of iterations. But regardless what, once we settle on certain designs and we'll show some results for different designs, the general target of testing, once we start the test, um, is simply to achieve, let's call it, favorable failure in the sample. And that favorable failure is simply described by uh, basically a crack close to the center of the sample. That being said, because when you're doing the testing, you don't really know that this is going to generate FLC, a good FLC point or not. That happens several steps afterwards. Um, simply having good failure in the center does not guarantee good FLC points. Um, and we will see some results later on. The second thing to keep in mind during the testing phase is just to have sufficient number of images during testing, especially towards the end of the test. And that relies on your DIC. So your DIC must have enough frame rate or must provide enough frame rate, especially for high strength steels or brittle materials such as limited ductility aluminum alloys. And that's what matters during the testing stage. From both things considered, whether it's the sample geometry or the physical testing, what we're looking for is, again, favorable failure. And I'm showing here for Nakajima testing a nice set of samples. And as I said earlier, Nakajima testing is less challenging in terms of achieving this objective than Marchignac. And you can see like really nice failure across the board, four repeats, 10 or nine different geometries, everything worked out fantastic for this material, which happens to be a steel. When it comes to Marchignac, um, there are many things you have to pay attention to and just be prepared for. So you have different types of issues with Marchignac. The first one is um, failure away from the center. And I'm highlighting here a couple of examples for an aluminum alloy. And of course, aluminum is challenging. Um, another type of failure is edge failure. Uh, even though ultimately you see a crack right in the middle of the sample, but if it starts from the edge, it just doesn't count. It doesn't work and it will not lead you to good FLC results. And then finally, you see failure in the center. Um, such as this particular case, and I think this is also a steel, that's a soft steel. And you can see the failure um, of those samples on the right-hand side, close to the biaxial, um, is not really clean. Um, it's not really clear. And when you actually look at the DIC results, you will notice that this is really branching out in different directions, and that doesn't help your DIC algorithms to get FLC points, or good FLC points. So that's another problem with uh, Marchignac testing. Now, how can you resolve these issues? Different things need to be done, starting from the optimization of the geometry. And uh, I, I must say, not all the time things work, especially depending on the material and how challenging it is. But, you know, we don't want to draw a black picture or a dark picture here. Um, sometimes we could get really nice results with Marchignac, but that really depends on the material that we're trying to test, such as the case here. That's a very nice set of Marchignac samples that were very successful, very good. Let's go to the next step, processing, DIC. The DIC processing step itself is not really demanding. And like I said earlier, any DIC software should be able to do this step, which is just the correlation, correlating the images and giving you like really nice surface strain maps like the one that I'm showing here. There's nothing special about it and there's not really much to add here. The only thing we would like to add here is if, you know, um, if you would like to be consistent, we recommend maintaining a, you know, a, a fixed number or a good number for the reference length or the point distance or whatever it's called, depending on your software. Uh, and in essence, what we're talking about here is the equivalent, the equivalent to the mesh size in finite element analysis. That's again a feature in your software, regardless of what it's called. It just describes the equivalent mesh to finite element analysis. And for us, we've been using something close to one millimeter because that's a very nice mesh size, not too fine, not too coarse. And that will skew the results of your FLC uh, analysis down the road. Um, the previous slide or this particular slide here just shows an Akajima sample. To compare it to a Marchignac sample, just on the processing side, you will see some differences. You'll see that there are some strain accumulations around the sample, around the perimeter, and you cannot avoid that. 
and you will see the accumulation that you're interested in, which is close to the center. Unfortunately, most of those central accumulations happen very late in the test, not like Nakajima. Nakajima starts really from the beginning, where the localization stays roughly in the center unless your friction problem is out of control. Marshniak is not. It starts with accumulation around the perimeter, and ultimately, if the test is successful, you're going to see some accumulation at the end of the test, right in the center, and we will have a video to show you uh, what we're talking about. And that is a challenge with Marshniak, and that's why the failure rate in Marshniak testing is much higher than Nakajima. Let's go to the post analysis, post BIC analysis, or the post processing step. After we get those strains, depends on what kind of algorithm we are interested in to obtain the FNC points. And we will start with the most popular method, which is the section method described in the ISO 12004, in which it says you should draw five virtual sections uh, across the crack line and obtain the distributions of those strains, both major and minor, and track them throughout the test, all the way to the end of the test. And then the frame before failure, we focus on that one, and we perform a parabolic fit to that particular section in the central region, and we obtain a major minor strain combination that represents an FLC point. To describe it better, maybe I would borrow this schematic, a nice schematic, that focuses on one section. Um, you can see the red points are the major, and then the yellow ones are the minor, and the black fit is the parabolic fit that we're talking about to the central or the middle region of, of that section, and those two orange points would represent the major minor strain combination that is a point on the FLC. Obviously, because we have five sections per sample, you get five points for every test sample, and when you repeat it three, four times, you get multiple uh, sample averages, and then you get a geometry average from there, and that leads to an FLC like the one we showed earlier. From a Marshniak versus Nakajima, the sections are obviously different, whether you do this kind of testing or that. Uh, Nakajima tests typically lead to better section profiles, like the one you see here. Of course, you will still see some roughness, but that's okay. Um, it's still manageable. Marshniak is a bit harder to deal with, and that's an example of the type of section you get with Marshniak. You must reject the stuff on the outside simply because it doesn't count and focus on the center, but even in the center, you can see that sometimes it's difficult to find a parabolic fit, and that's why results could be skewed, or sometimes you have no successful FLC point that comes out of it. But if all done correctly, and we will talk about several cases later on, with the section-based method, a good FLC would most likely look like this, where you have good number of points, more than five, and good distribution of points that covers most of the FLC, as you can see here. Let's go to the second method, which is not very popular, but it is requested in certain, uh, uh, by certain OEMs, and that's the linear best fit method. Um, and you can find more details about it in the literature, but what we need to focus on here is that there are no sections involved here. What happens in this method or approach is that we focus on a certain point or a region of small region of maximum strain. Um, we identify that region, and we calculate the effective strain, or usually called thickness strain, and we find the derivative for it. And from that derivative, we plot a line against time, or we plot the curve against time. And when that slope, when the slope of the critic uh, of the um, uh, thinning rate or the strain rate reaches a certain critical value, we pin it down and we take those two combina we take those two points at the combination of major and minor strains, and we consider it an FLC point. Um, for that particular condition. So basically, it requires um, taking the strain rate and tracking the evolution of that. So that's why it's usually called a time-dependent method. And when the rate goes really high or basically starts escalating high, it sort of represents a point of necking, the point of necking that we're interested in in terms of probability, and that's what defines an FLC point. Because there are no sections, every sample produces only one point um, for FLC, and that's why a typical LBF forming limit curve shows lower density of points um, compared to the section method. But again, here's a sample of a good FLC that was obtained with the LBF method for a certain material, and again, nice distribution of points that covers the 
the entire FLC domain. So now that we cover the process, let's go to the highlights. Notes, remarks, comparisons, and some important information that we would like to share with you, especially people who have experience in this kind of testing um, and have done it for, let's say, a wide range of materials um, before. So let's talk about certain items. And I'm going to start with the, uh, the last one that we just covered in terms of the analyses. Section method versus LBF method. This is, um, again, uh, something we encounter when we work with certain OEMs because they require, let's say, the LBF method, and we typically try to compare it with the section method. And I would like to present some um, results for certain materials. Um, this is for a mild steel. Um, and of course, in all these plots that I'm going to show, the orange one is the LBF method, and the, light, the yellow one is the section method. And so this is a mild steel, a very soft steel, going a bit higher to an HSLA. Um, and this is uh, most likely a hot hold material. Then we go to a BH steel, which is really close to a mild steel. Um, then we go to a Gen 3 steel. That's almost a thousand megapascal steel. And then ultimately, I also added uh, an aluminum material or an aluminum alloy here, the equivalent of a modern 6000 series here. From all these, you can see that the FLCs that are based on the LBF method are typically more, uh, sorry, this is a mistake, they're less conservative. So they're basically more generous in terms of the FLC. They're typically higher than the ones obtained by the section method. And we've noticed this regardless of the material, the grade, the thickness. Very seldom we see um, the section method higher than the LBF method. The difference between the two could be zero depending on the loading conditions, sometimes on the balance by axial tension side, but it could be very large as you saw in, in those diagrams. And the difference between them is not systematic. You, you can't say, for example, hey, if I have the section based um, FLC, I can just draw an LBF, um, just basically move it upwards by a certain amount and that's the LBF. It's not really that straightforward. And one other thing that we notice from our work with LBF method is that it is uh, basically there's more scatter involved with the LBF method compared to the section method, which seems to be a little bit more or basically a bit more stable. And finally, the LBF method is way more demanding in terms of the post analysis. It's very typical that we would run a first uh, round of post analysis and then we would have to reconsider the macros or the scripts and we would have to adjust things and look closely and make some adjustments and sometimes retest again. It really takes way more effort to produce an FLC by LBF compared to the section method. Only European OEMs require the LBF method and um, I, I haven't honestly encountered any North American OEM that requires the LBF method. So that's basically something to keep in mind in terms of where you know, the effort is needed for the LBF method. Um, let's go to the second um, item of comparison here, which is Nakajima versus Marchignac. And this is a nice video for a Nakajima test. And they're usually, again, if you can control your friction um, in the test, you should get some nice results like this one here, where you have a nice accumulation of strains. And I said, as I said earlier, they usually start early on in the test where you can see them localizing in the center. And ultimately, um, it should lead to a nice fracture or crack close to the center of the sample. Um, in comparison, if you were to perform a Marchignac test, um, look at the distribution of strains. Um, you still have higher strains around the perimeter of the sample than the center. And only towards the end of the test, you see the central zone, again, if, it's, if the test is successful, would start becoming more dominant and ultimately leads to failure. But the problem with this is that it happens really late in the test and that might not be sufficient to provide you with a good FLC point. One last note about this particular video, please keep it in mind because we will refer to this video later on when we talk about a certain type of aluminum alloys. As you can see, this particular aluminum alloy experiences or exhibits some banding that you can clearly notice in the center of the sample right before failure. And that obviously is not a good thing and leads to more complications. Okay, so now let's try to do a comparison between the two. Obviously, it's not typical that we get requests for both of them, but sometimes we try to jump on opportunities if we can to try to provide data like this one. And this was a nice study in which we had 
the capacity and the material to do both Nakajima and Marshinyak on the same exact lot of material. And that's the sum up of these of this particular project. In essence, we obtained what we were hoping to obtain. The results are comparable, but there is a shift or a skew that's caused by the bending effect that is known to be associated with Nakajima test. Number one, the FLC04, the Nakajima was of course shifted to the right and should be slightly higher than the one for Marshinyak. But other than that, the rest of the curve or the rest of the FLCs should be comparable um, and again, slightly higher for Nakajima testing. And that's basically what we have here. Um, you would expect the Nakajima to be always offset to the right. Uh, we've never had a Nakajima test that produces FLC0 right on the PST line, and that's expected. The section method and the LBF method, both of them, sorry, both of them are less stable for a machine neck testing approach, regardless what and regardless of the material. So if you must perform an FLC test and the LBF method is required, we would advise to go with the Nakajima approach just to minimize trouble um, because already the LBF method is, is very demanding and, and again, it's not very stable. Um, both North American and European OEMs require the Nakajima approach. And very few OEMs in North America require the Marginiac approach. So from that perspective, that basically is the point of ease that your typical go-to approach is most likely going to be Nakajima um, and so on. Uh, one last note here is that Nakajima is known to have non-linear -strain, non strain paths. Uh, again, cannot be eliminated because of the geometry, but there are multiple papers in the literature that talk about the correction and often that correction is not really required um, by OEMs and tier one suppliers. Um, material thickness. This is something we were very lucky to have a wealth of information because we tested so many materials and sometimes they happen to be the same grade but just different thicknesses. So we wanted to share just some highlights. Sometimes the comparison is not really fair because saying that it's the same grade but different thickness doesn't really mean that it's the same microstructure, obviously. Um, but, and, and, and other, basically other parameters might not be the same, but at least we try to get some, some insights from the results that we have. And here I'm showing a couple of materials. So this is for an HSLA, uh, roughly less than a millimeter to 1.2 millimeter. We see that, you know, there's a slightly higher FLC04, the 1.2 material, which is expected. Um, but the interesting thing to point out here is, look at the difference between the LBF and the section methods for both materials, which is technically the same material with different things. It's, it's not exactly the same. And that's something to keep in mind. If I go to an aluminum alloy, this is a challenging aluminum alloy, 5182 or 5000 series in general, they're very challenging. And you can see here that there is a slight difference in the level, which is on the side of the thicker material as except, uh, uh, expected. And we've even tested the two millimeter uh, 5182, and again, the FLC is slightly higher. But please pay attention to the shape of the FLC and notice that they're not exactly the same. Let's go to another material, a CR420, uh, that's another HSLA. This is the same exact thickness of the material, but they're basically provided by two different steel mills, and so they're, therefore they're totally different. And you can see that is reflected here. So even though they're the same thickness, even though their tension curves are very similar, their FLC curves are different and their FLC zero is also different. Finally, I have a, a nice example of a material that we were, um, you know, we tested several thicknesses of different coils of different thicknesses. And I'm just going to run through them very quickly. This is a trip 780. Just please take a very quick look at them. You'll notice that there are, even though the, thick, the thicknesses are very close to each other, there were some differences both in the FLC zero and the general shape of the FLCs um, from one thickness to the other. What we're trying to allude to here in terms of presenting FLCs and material thickness is that we recommend avoid using those thickness slash strain hardening exponent based FLC formulas uh, simply because they don't work for most of the steels and they don't work necessarily for aluminum alloys. And that's something we see from basically lab results, regardless what material we consider. I would like to end the presentation 
with talking about the highlights for steels and aluminiums, the guidelines for steels and aluminiums. And I tried to summarize this in the last four slides. So let's start with steels. When it comes to steels, if we're considering first gen and third gen steels, and that's basically DPs, strips, um, UP steels, and the third gen steels, the new ones, we typically say that there are no problems technically in performing FLCs for these materials. They're technically very friendly. Nakajima testing works quite nicely. And if your DIC is good and your analysis is good, you typically get good FLCs. And your main concern there is just basically having good coverage for the FLC and also having good tonnage to prevent slipping, especially when you go towards the third gen steels. And that's um, absolutely true for most of these steels that I mentioned. And therefore, we don't recommend going to Marchignac unless you have to. You know, there's no need to invite trouble there because Marchignac does not work for high strength steels that easily and it doesn't work for thick steels. So Nakajima works very nicely and you can basically get some good results there. The most challenging of all the steels are or is technically the class of mild steels and some of the HSLA simply because they're softer, friction becomes difficult to control or eliminate and that leads to offs to the offset of the crack point from the center of the sample, and that leads to some trouble. For such materials, you don't really have a problem on the left-hand side of the FLC. You typically have a problem on the right-hand side. And that's where you might have to shift to the Marchignac test simply because that's a good remedy to the friction problem. Even though it will introduce some other problems like edge failure, the need for more sample optimization or geometry optimization, and some more work on the post-processing side. But it is what it is, and that's why these steels, even though they're softer, sorry, they're softer, they're technically more demanding in terms of FLC testing. And I would like to show here just a couple of examples of FLC tests. The one on the left is a mild steel, the one on the right is a third gen steel. You can see the third gen steel is really nice FLC, covers both sides very nicely. But the one on the left hand side, you see that big gap between the biaxial and the plain steel, and sometimes this is really difficult to fill for these materials, and it is what it is, and you have to live with it. Aluminium alloys, I broke it into actually two types of alloys, just like I did with the steel. If we're dealing with 6,000 series, regardless whether it's conventional or new generation alloy that is equivalent to 6,000 series, they're relatively easier to deal with than other types of aluminium alloys like the 5,000 series, but they're not as nice as steels. So generally they fall somewhere in between um, the two. The main issue of course you have here is friction because aluminium is soft and gummy, just like mild steel, and so expect some deviation from uh, center failure. The left-hand side is typically okay. Your problem is with the right-hand side. Um, you know, with mild steels, we said just switch to Marchignac and you know, do some optimization and you typically get a good or decent FLC. For aluminum, switching to Marchignac is not necessarily going to work all the time, simply because you invite some other problems that are not really there with mild steels. Uh, one of them is uh, serious edge failures, especially for those samples, um, the notched design. Um, and of course, you're adding more complexity with Marchignac testing. So not all the time it works to go or to shift from Nakajima to Marchignac. So um, it might be necessary to just improve your um, friction mitigation approach. For us, we typically go in this hierarchy. Uh, try to focus on Nakajima testing as much as possible. Um, if we give up and we're not getting what we need, we have to switch to Marchignac, then we switch to Marchignac. And if that turns out to be not working, we must move to non-conventional approaches, the like of which we will cover in the next webinar. And this is basically an example of um, one of those FLCs that worked out really nice. Um, and this is a uh, Marchignac test. 5,000 series is a totally different story. Um, that's mainly the 5182. That's the one that we usually get um, requests for uh, the most. This is a problematic material regardless what. Um, you don't only have the friction problem. You also have PLC banding inherent to these materials. You can't eliminate it. So um, there's really nothing you can do about it except just try to optimize. The left-hand side is technically bad because of PLC banding, and the right-hand side is bad because of friction. So you have a problem on both sides. Um, again, moving to Marchignac does not necessarily solve your problem. Um, and in many cases, we found out that it doesn't. So again, we follow the same hierarchy, and it's not unusual for us to go to these non-conventional approaches. 
LBF is extremely difficult for 5000 series aluminum alloys, so we always advise to not even attempt it because you have a jumping band that will not allow you to get the um, effective strain rate path that you really need. And this is uh, an example of a successful 5182 FLC. And as you can see that there's a big gap in the middle of the right hand section, and that's something you cannot avoid with machine yard testing for these materials. So that was my last slide, and I would like to just wrap it up by saying we provided a, uh, an overview of FLC testing, the background, the equipment, tooling, and you know some details about the testing and how to basically get the DIC data and use it in a post-analysis step to approaches to obtain FLC points. The focus today was on automotive sheet metals, and we highlighted some of the issues encountered with you know, the materials, steels versus aluminum alloys, and also with the different approaches, whether it's the LBF method versus the section-based method and Nakajima versus Marchignac. We hope this was informative, again, for both types of um, colleagues who have experience in this domain or who are trying to enter this domain. Um, we will continue with a second part um, in the near future. And in that webinar, we will focus on more advanced topics. And the topics that we're going to address there are going to be going to high rate testing or at least intermediate FLC testing. This is not very conventional, but we get some requests for that. So I think it's going to be a very interesting topic. Uh, higher than amb ambient temperature testing that's necessary for warm forming and hot forming or hot stamping. Non-conventional materials such as magnesium alloys, titanium alloys also. We will cover some of that and mainly the non-conventional testing approaches, um, cases where Nakajima and Marshinia do not work. And finally, we will dedicate a section of that webinar to talk about very thin foils and laminates because this is something that is growing um, and we get uh, requests for that as well. And we hope to see you in that webinar. For today, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, we hope, again, the webinar was useful and I will. I, we have about seven minutes, so I will stop here to allow um, some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Fadi, for the nice presentation. We have a couple of questions from our viewers. Uh, the first question is, do you propose any best practices on how to control friction in Nakajima testing? Um, there isn't really um, an approach that works with all materials. Um, the ISO 12004 has some recommendations in that regard. Um, and typically, or generally speaking, we can say that the use of combination of Teflon and oil or grease typically works. And, um, and in some cases, you might have to go to the extreme scenarios uh, where you need like some really more complex sandwiches, they call them by the ISO standard. But I would say, generally speaking, uh, a good combination of Teflon and oil slash grease is a good way to start uh, with lubrication. But I must say there are some cases where, especially like um, aluminum alloys and mild steels, where that doesn't really work. And you might have to go to more complex sandwiches, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you. The second question is, as the Nakajima test involves bending, how much does the tool punch radius and die opening affect the FLC results? So let's start with the tool. Um, because the tool is fixed 100 millimeters, um, there's not really, uh, let's put it this way, there is an effect, and that effect is relatively small because the tool radius is relatively large, which is 50 millimeters. Um, quantifying it, there are some papers in the literature that talk about a comparison, direct comparison between Nakajim and Marchignac, and they describe that difference. And it's, I don't want to say it's like zero. It, it, it is there, but it's not very significant. If you drop the punch size, which again, per the ISO, you're not supposed to drop it, but we've seen some people do uh, an equivalent to the ISO standard, which is like the ASTM standard, in which there's a 50 millimeter punch that will affect or skew the results and will push the bending effects a little bit higher. But again, per the ISO standard, it's just one sample or one punch geometry, and, and that should be okay. In regards to the die entry radius, it really, I mean, at least I feel it doesn't really affect the results 
in terms of shifting the FLC up and down or right and left. It mainly drives the success of the FLC test itself. If the fillet radius is not ideal, you will get edge failure there. And we've seen this time and time again for specifically aluminum alloys and hard steels. So the choice of the die entry radius for your binder is going to dictate again whether your FLC or your sample will be usable for FLC point extraction or not. But it will not really affect that FLC point whether it's going to go higher or lower. Thank you. Another interesting question regarding DIC processing is uh, when referring to the grid size of one millimeter, is that the point to point distance or is it including the strain tensor neighborhood? Also, when using the section method, do the sections have to be perpendicular to the crack? Okay, so I'll start with the second one. Section method per the ISO standard says that you should be perpendicular to the crack unless it's a sample on the left hand side. And in that case, you must just follow the major axis of the sample, and that's described in the ISO standard. But generally speaking, for plane strain to the biaxial, you should be perpendicular to the crack. As for the other question about the point distance in the DIC analysis, this is basically an arbitrary choice. We do it simply because we want to be consistent all the time. Now, the point to point distance, does it take the tensor neighborhood um, into account? Yes, because the tensor neighborhood there is, of course, built in into the algorithm. And I think you can set it to the minimum. And that's what we typically do. We set it to the bare minimum which is one, and we do not recommend using any higher, basically, strain tensors because all what you're doing is basically averaging and you're offsetting or skewing your mesh size, um, and of course, it's going to go larger than one millimeter. So keep the tensor neighborhood to one, the minimum in your software, and try to get that reference length to be as close as possible to a certain number and stick to it. But the reason I said one millimeter is because, you know, within the domain, it felt to us like it's a very good, it's actually more on the fine size when it comes to a mesh size, and it usually produces very good results. Okay. The last question here is, uh, with regard to strength non-uniformity across the width, what do you suggest we should be sampling for true representation of FLC plot? I'm sorry, say that again, Akshat, you said strength non-uniformity? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, I might have to think about this question before I suggest something. Yeah, I need to think about it. So maybe we'll get back um, to the audience on this question by, you know, a general answer by email. Sure. I think we are hitting the time limit and uh, that's a wrap for the questions too. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Akshat. And again, we thank you all for attending this webinar, and we look forward to see you again in a future webinar. Thank you very much.